Uh, at this time, it's my honor to invite Welcome Wilson Jr. to the stage to introduce our next panel. In addition to his service as a Trellis Foundation board member, Welcome is also on the Trellis Company Board, the University of Houston Board of Regents, and one of the new appointees to the Board of Directors for the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Apart from his considerable service in the higher education sector, Mr. Wilson is also the president and CEO of the Welcome Group in Houston, Texas. And the foundation benefits from his leadership and keen ability to draw connections between business and education, all with a huge heart for students and a commitment to their success. Welcome, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. If uh, Rob is still here, I was going to wish him luck tonight when uh, Kansas plays Clemson. Uh, unfortunately, our Texas team, through I'm sure what were some unfair calls, uh, didn't, uh, didn't make the cut. Although I've had many opportunities to serve the community and the state, higher education has a, been a particular interest of mine over the years. Through my involvement with Trellis, the Board of Regents of the University of Houston, system and now the higher education coordinating board i understand the true value of strong leadership and sound policy in f fostering student success in texas we are fortunate that our workforce higher education and k-12 through agencies are working together in unprecedented ways to help students and find and follow a path and lead to a meaningful career and a fulfilling life in the next section of our program, we explore the current successes and challenges of the agency's collaborative work. To that end, it is my pleasure to introduce our next panel. Mr. Andre Alcantar serves as chairman of the Texas Workforce Commission, working to implement customized services to meet the needs of Texas' vast array of industries and advance the development of a strong and competitive workforce. Prior to joining TWC eight years ago, Andre served as Deputy Director of the Governor's Office Division of Budget Planning and Policy. Mr. Mike Morath is the Texas Commissioner of Education at the Texas Education Agency, overseeing pre-kindergarten through high school education for more than 5 million, and I'll repeat for emphasis, 5 million enrolled in both traditional public schools and charter schools in the state. Finally, Dr. Raymond Paredes, Commissioner of, Texas, of Higher Education, has served the state of Texas at the Higher Education Coordinating Board since 2006. His commitment to post-secondary education includes 30 years of service as a faculty member and administrator at UCLA, as well as roles in philanthropy at the Rockefeller Foundation and Hispanic Scholarship Fund. And I, w I would like to ask uh, Evan Smith and our commissioners to come to the stage. And Dr. Paredes, I want to point out I'm wearing my uh, pen, my, my, my 60 by 30 pen, uh, which we all should think about every day. Welcome everybody to the stage, please. I was mean to the president of the Fed, so I'm going to be nice to you guys. Oh, great. Uh, great. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> we didn't believe no, we, we've done this before. Um, so we're really here to do a check-in on the tri-agency uh, effort. You all were, uh, were convened, in a sense, by the governor uh, about two years ago to combine forces to address many of the challenges we've talked about today and some we haven't. And I think it's important as backdrop and context for this audience to very quickly say what your charge was when the three of you or your agencies were asked to put uh, in together to do this work. The governor charged you in March 2016 with identifying and advancing public and higher ed initiatives to make college more affordable and to emphasize marketable skills for students as they enter the workforce. You were charged with working with the industry and local stakeholders to assess local workforce needs, identify workforce development models, coordinating with industry, and promote post-secondary success. Evaluate efforts of your agencies, state and local, and web-based education and career awareness systems to link parents and students with a better array of high-demand jobs and the educational requirements necessary. Identifying gaps in services specifically for Texas veterans to advance strategies to enhance their education and employment opportunities, and of course, tie all this together in a nice bow with a button-like welcomes that says 60 by 30. Basically, align all of those efforts with the 60 by 30 plan. 
By memory is that you did a statewide tour. You did more than half a dozen trips around the state, came back together in November, and identified four principal recommendations in a report that set out, again, this is now 16 months ago, how important this work would be and the ways that you would get from here to there. I want to ask you to begin about those recommendations from November. Let's check your work. Let's see, having established what those priorities are in November 2016, what you've done to achieve them to this point. And Chairman Alcantara, I'm going to begin with you. Okay. The first of those November 2016 recommendations was identify statewide initiatives for the next generation that will make Texas the clear leader in targeted fields and position the state for economic preeminence. What have you done to accomplish that? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the question. <laughs> we have no time for good mornings. <laughs> we, we have certainly uh, yeah. done what we intended to do. We've worked together. Uh, we've worked in partnership to identify our assets, to uh, analyze what the commitments are from our local and, and uh, regional partners, and have moved forward with the uh, recommendations that we uh, developed in response to the charge. We've uh, worked collectively to uh, better develop tools that uh, support our students working in partnership with uh, UT on the Encore system. We've all been a part of that. Our staff have worked together to analyze the tools and the design of that system that has now incorporated revamped tools for our students, their parents, and the counselors and teachers to work with. Uh, our reality check tool has been updated, Evan. Yep. Our career check uh, has replaced uh, the uh, Texas CARES. We've worked together t uh, with the Higher Ed Coordinating Board on making sure that, uh, that Texas CRUISE has been uh, enhanced and uh, through Launch My Career, we continue to uh, really advance that work. We've also worked really hard and in earnest to uh, really align uh, and uh, leverage the work we've done with early colleges. Uh, trying to maintain that industry line focused and through our partnership through the uh, Texas Innovative Academies of which we uh, funded 19, Mike, uh, I yeah, believe right. a couple years ago. We've really maintained a, a focus on these regional areas of strength where our students are going to be uh, not only uh, provided with career pathways aligned with the, with the needs of industry yeah. within this new early college framework, uh, they're going to get career guidance, they're going to get mentoring, they're going to get opportunities for internships, a clear focus on applied learning, and really uh, advancing uh, that work has been a uh, key component of a number of the other things that we're doing, but uh, yeah. I could speak for an hour, uh, but let's, uh, uh, let's start, stop with that for now. Oh, okay, so you, you, uh, you have a starting point and you have a destination. Your piece is basically the road that connects the starting point and the, de and the destination. Are, are you getting cooperation along that road? road. Is education on the one hand aligned with you on your goal? Is industry on the other hand aligned with you on your goal? Uh, industry is, uh, has been there with us, yeah. uh, wh whether we uh, are asking them to partner up through our local boards to come together with the ISD and uh, bringing in the, uh, each of these innovative academies as an example involves a community college and a university partner that's been identified so that we uh, provide efficiency and completion so that we uh, have a focus on high demand uh, sectors. In Austin, uh, we have partnerships uh, centered around IT uh, in, in the Gulf Coast. It's uh, biotech, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, it's uh, petrochem and energy. And, and the whole idea is to make sure that as we're putting together these models, that industry is there informing curriculum design, industry is there to provide the mentoring and the guidance. And they've been there with us as we launched our Texas Internship Challenge coming to Austin to really uh, affirm that commitment to make sure that we have more opportunities for our students to uh, right. uh, 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 have access to these very important applied learning opportunities. What has been the biggest obstacle in the last two years to accomplishing your goal? Well, the, uh, the magnitude of the work is certainly uh, an exciting part of the work. Right. Uh, the, uh, but you have the resources you need, you have the cooperation you need, you have the vision you believe to execute upon this. Uh, working with the uh, resources that we have available uh, through uh, our federal, state, and, and uh, local partnerships, we're doing all that we can to leverage uh, the work that is moving forward. These models, as we demonstrate them, as we roll them out, uh, will serve the basis for uh, defining how we can best scale and, uh, and really make a, a, an assessment of what additional resources we'll, we'll need 
in order to uh, make these uh, successes more uniform and really advance and elevate the uh, prospects yeah. for our students as we move forward. Really propelling our companies to keep creating jobs and uh, adding to the uh, overall economic expansion that we have in the state. Well, well, we'll come to job creation and where we are and where we need to go here in a little bit. Let me go to Commissioner Morath. One of the recommendations that you all put forward in November was to strengthen pre-kindergarten, come back to what um, uh, uh, Mr. Kaplan said, strengthen pre-kindergarten through high school academic instruction to establish students' foundational skills in math, science, language arts, and social studies so that students graduate career and college ready and are prepared for lifetime learning. Have you made progress on that recommendation? Yes, uh, in m more areas than we have time to discuss. Um, well, let me start with just sort of a superstructure. Sure. The, um, we have a, an, a, an accountability system uh, for our, our, our K-12 school system in Texas, which is really about setting goals and creating focus. That's the, the purpose of, of that. It, uh, and it, and with that, we, we have feedback loops for our educators to engage in uh, continuous improvement activities to strengthen what we do for our students. We have modified the accountability system um, so that it is uh, tightly aligned with the 60 by 30 plan, uh, yep. essentially defining success as getting 60% um, of our young people um, per performing at a level that would, would indicate that they are going to receive a post-secondary credential. This is the essence of the 60 by 30 uh, plan. And we've looked at the nature of the post-secondary credentials to include not just uh, pure play academic credentials, but we have um, meaningful industry credentials right. that have been informed by uh, Texas industry itself um, so that uh, you know, uh, when you think about, say, goal setting, you get the same credit for a student who scores high on the SAT as you do for a student who gets an advanced welding um, uh, right. certification. Um, uh, likewise, who enlists in the US military. Likewise, who actually already achieves an associate's degree. So the, the, the entire goal uh, setting framework for our public education system has been, has been shifted in the last two years with the uh, cooperation of these leaders and, the, uh, and their input um, to be tightly aligned with what our higher ed system is pushing towards and what our workforce needs. Yeah. Um, that's, that's just one uh, piece, it's a big piece, but um, in addition you see a lot of investments in capacity um, in the K-12 system. So thinking about um, uh, pre-K in particular, what we launched um, specifically grew out of the, the Tri-Agency Workforce uh, Commission because the Texas Workforce Commission oversees subsidies for private child care. And all over the state of Texas, you have private child care providers and you have school districts, and never do the two shall meet. So what we've done is, um, with uh, Commissioner Alcantar's help, have, have created a um, technical assistance and grant structure for school districts to lead partnership efforts with private child care providers in their area. With the, um, so the school district can drive resources into the private child care um, sector um, and um, improve uh, technical assistance uh, from a quality perspective to increase the quality of the entire early ed ecosystem. Right. Um, in addition to that, um, we have um, improved the level of curricular resources that are available in the early grades and the early years. You have to have a rigorous, um, you know, a structured uh, building blocks a sort of knowledge rich curriculum that um, uh, builds phonics and decoding skills as well as vocabulary that builds um, mathematical reasoning skills um, in a very methodical way our math innovation zones um, uh, project which again came out of the uh, tri-agency workforce uh, commission recommendations is a is a way to cement um, uh, an approach to learning in the classrooms that the only acceptable uh, endpoint for students is mastery of each mathematical concept. Right. Um, and teachers are supported with the appropriate resources and curriculum so that that um, kind of a academic foundation is laid. Are, so, you, are you seeing on the ground, Commissioner, in the schools and in the school districts, an embrace of this goal and the uh, willingness to collaborate in non-traditional ways to accomplish it? Absolutely. And, and let me switch to the other end of the continuum and just talk about high school. So, um, we have um, a, a relatively large number of early college high schools, and this is a traditional partner, this is an, an innovative partnership between ISDs and their higher ed partners, be, right. be it a community college or a four-year institution. Students who attend an early college high school um, in no small numbers graduate with associate's degrees at the same time they get their high school diploma. Right. 
um, that model has been um, iterated through to, um, to a P-TECH framework so that industry becomes the third leg of the, of the stool. So you have, you have the K-12, you have higher ed, and you have industry all at the table so that in addition to getting associate's degrees, the, 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 the kids have paid internship experiences in specific uh, workforce settings to build up uh, um, that sort of workforce readiness. That kind of innovation, that kind of iteration is happening all over the state. Yesterday I was in Texas City and they threw up a, a collaborative partnership at the local level with their uh, industry partners, have a specialized uh, high school that they're rotating th um, 300 kids in the, in the region through, and this is only in its first year of iteration, where the kids um, are learning uh, the maritime trades. There's actually a, um, a simulator in the high school that you can sit in front of and get seasick uh, during because it's a pretty, uh, right. uh, pretty trippy experience. But you're learning how to you know, get your um, license to drive a tugboat or a large, um, uh, a large maritime right there, and, in, right, it, right there in Texas City yeah. high, uh, high Schools. And right. that's, that, that's on top of heavy equipment um, uh, operation, uh, right. electrician development, uh, pipe fitting, um, uh, plumbing, carpentry, right. you name it. This is a, this is a 21st century um, uh, approach to vocational education, which is really um, career and technology education. And that kind of innovation is happening all over the place. And, we're, and the, the sort of tri-agency work is spurring it to happen at faster and faster rates. So before we go to Commissioner Paredes, let me ask you the same question I asked uh, Chairman Alcantar, and that is what is the obstacle, the main obstacle to you accomplishing this piece, your piece of the recommendations? If you can change one thing. Well, th when you think about the size and scope of Texas. Um, We're not uh, going to be able to change that. I'm it, sorry. It, <laughs> it, is, it is, in fact, um, it is in fact the, the essence of the challenge. I mean, if we, we were in Delaware, we could reform the entire school system in about a week. That's it. Oh. Um, the, uh, with uh, all due uh, consideration to my colleagues that I've hired from Delaware. Too late. The, the, um, Too late. Uh, the, the, um, um, the, I think the biggest obstacle that we have um, is just inertia. Um, nobody's opposed to these kinds of changes, but you have all of your life experience that um, tells who, you. Who you, or what commissioner is inert? You're going to regret my continuing down this line of discussion. Uh, we all are. Um, I, I'm informed by my own life experience, and I've done things a certain way. And and it takes it takes really. Um, um, particular conditions for a leader to be able to sort of raise their head above sea level so that they're, they, they don't see the waves that they have now, but they see the waves that are five miles so, so away. So it's, it's the sort of human nature to be resistant to change, no matter how much you may talk about yourself as open to change or I'm a disruptor or whatever else, most of us are quite actually hidebound in the end. Yeah, I don't know that I would go so far, but uh, human nature is essentially part of this. This is a, this is a change management exercise on an epic scale right. uh, that involves 5.3 million um, students in our public school system, 700,000 adults in our school system across 8,600 individual schools and 1,200 school systems. Right. That's the, the scale um, and how the systems perform today is the essence of the problem at hand and how we um, facilitate that process of change system-wide. Got it. All right, hi, Commissioner Predis. Hi. How are you? Um, so you had a recommendation, or one that I associate with you and with your work at the Coordinating Board as, as part of the November document, build a proactive and ongoing partnership among TEA, the Coordinating Board, and the Workforce Commission and other stakeholders to align the educational goals of Texas with the 60 by 30 plan, which among other things, famously, as the name would indicate, uh, uh, calls for 60% of 25 to 34 year olds to hold either a certificate or degree by 2030. And then there's a bunch of other stuff in the 60 by 30 plan that is also quite important. How have you done along that path to this point? We're uh, getting better, but we're not getting better fast enough. Uh, right. We're making progress. Uh, I think when we launched uh, 60 by 30 Texas, the uh, percentage of uh, young adults uh, that would help us meet our goal is uh, that had a post-secondary credential was about 38, 39%. We're up to close to 42%, which is significant progress for the reasons that Mike just mentioned, that we have such a huge education system. It's tough to move all the parts at once, uh, but uh, we're gonna have to accelerate progress in order to reach our goals. The, the other, uh, the, the other uh, inhibitor is uh, the, uh, we're not embracing innovation fast enough. Uh, I, I don't think, um, I, I say over and over again, we can't get to the goals of 60 by 30 
Texas by doing business as usual. We've, we've, we haven't, uh, for example, reformed developmental education fast enough. Uh, there's a huge body of research that shows, for example, that, uh, that uh, reading and writing should not be taught in separate courses except in the most extreme circumstances when students have no word skills at all and need to be taught right. basic phonemic awareness and uh, word attack skills and so forth. Uh, we've been talking about this for over 10 years. In fact, we've been talking about this since I arrived and we're at the point now where I think somewhere around 35 to 40% of uh, institutions have combined integrated reading and writing into one course. That's way too long yeah. to move in the right direction. Um, I, think we have, I, I think we have some financial challenges, although I testified before the Senate Higher Education Committee a couple of days ago, and I pointed, pointed out that higher education has in fact been doing more with less. I don't think we could keep doing that much longer, right. but we have been getting better. But you think that more resources in your bucket would help you achieve your goal or help you achieve it that much faster? Targeted resources with accountability factors. Right. You feel the same way? More resources would help you? I mean, let's leave Harvey out of it. It's an anomaly. It's a big anomaly. We'll come to that. But generally speaking, as the school finance conversation continues down the path, more resources allows you to achieve your goal? I'm never going to argue against more resources. Um, right. Well, you know, some, but it's not that surprising. Some will argue yeah. that more resources are, in fact, not necessary. Yeah, well, the only people that I know that work for free in our school system are school board members. Um, everybody else is, is right. collecting a check. Oh, believe me, they pay. They just don't pay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the pay comes in the afterlife. But I think I would echo um, uh, uh, Dr. Paredes' as comments. The, it's, it's targeted resources um, uh, with, with specific outcomes in mind. Um, targeted towards practices that we know drive outcomes quickly. And adequate accountability on the back end metrics for success that can be seen and measured. That's right. Right. Dr. Perez, how much is your success uh, uh, impacted by or determined by his success? In other words, I remember being on a program with the three commissioners, although at that time it was Michael Williams, not Mike Moran, different Mike. But you two were here. And it was after the decision by the legislature to kill the Algebra 2 requirement. A decision that you opposed, a decision that you opposed, and a decision that he opposed. In some respects, the concern was that if we clog up the pipe here, we're not gonna have success here. Do you still believe that there's a direct link between his success and your success? We can't be successful without uh, K through 12 being successful. Right. It's, they, they, they make students college ready or don't. Right. Make them college How ready. are they doing as far as that goes in your opinion right now? We're, we got a long way to go. Right. I, I Look at him when you say that. <laughs> no, we, we, uh, we, we're on the same side. We, uh, we, we've had uh, yeah. eyeball to eyeball conversations <laughs> about this a lot. Right. Uh, I, I don't think there's any question that Mike has put us on the right path. Yeah. And I'm very optimistic, but we've got a long way to go. How much is your success determined by their success? Uh, fundamentally, uh, I think that... Uh, the underlying, an underlying issue is we have a, a kid in a rural area. Yep. We have a kid in a, an urban area, a single parent, uh, a foster kid, uh, two working parents working really hard. And they're in middle school and uh, they haven't yet dreamed about what they want to be. Uh, they haven't yet understood uh, what's out there. Uh, they are now in eighth grade and they're facing some of the same issues. They really uh, don't quite understand what this beautiful economy of ours provides to them. And as we're going about doing the necessary work of building these frameworks under House Bill 5 or under the prior framework, the issues are fundamentally the same. Uh, they need to get ex uh, excited about careers in manufacturing. They need to understand the relevance of what they're learning in the classroom uh, to uh, what is available to them out there. Uh, when they're a sophomore in high school, as they've uh, started the uh, uh, their pathway, their journey towards uh, getting prepared. Uh, many of them still are, have a very cursory understanding of what these opportunities are and uh, whether or not they're in the right uh, pathway relative to what they really think they want to do. And uh, I think that the necessary work of building these frameworks, strengthening our curriculum needs to be, uh, we need to continue to accelerate that work and move, move it forward. 
these applied learning internships, uh, these applied learning opportunities, internships, externships, co-ops, fellowships, please join the internship challenge. Please provide all of you uh, an opportunity for our students uh, in our high schools and our colleges and universities a chance to explore the world of work. Uh, but fundamentally, as we go about doing all of this, uh, we are going to have to uh, really uh, address the issue of how we more uniformly make our students in all of these different circumstances in these different neighborhoods around the state understand the relevance of what they're learning, get excited uh, about uh, Algebra 1, Algebra 2, because they understand it's a pathway to opening up the door, the window. And, uh, and then we work together to make sure that our, that our teachers are subject matter experts who uh, do, do, uh, deliver quality instruction, that they're right. supported and they're trained, and that we do all that is necessary to get it done. So the, answer, uh, the short answer, now that I've given you the long one, is right. I think we're working effectively on doing uh, the, uh, uh, the enhancements that need to occur in our uh, design and in our frameworks, but we're still going to have to really elevate our ability to... Uh, inform and excite students as we move forward. So before we go to the, I, I like that answer and it tees up something for Commissioner Morath. Before we go to the fourth recommendation which relates to veterans, I do want to come back to you because I hear uh, Chairman Alcantar talk about teachers as a component in this. And you, you and I have had many times together up on a stage talking about the challenges of public education and very nearly every time I ask you a question about what it's going to take, your answer is teachers. Whatever the question is, your answer is teachers. Population growth, teachers. Demographic change, <laughs> teachers, urbanization, teachers. It's like playing handball. I'm a one-trick yeah. pony. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. But it's an, important, it's an important topic, and I wonder if you have made any progress in terms of the ability to recruit, train, adequately pay, and retain teachers if we assume that that is still the most important component of your success. We have, uh, I think the answer is we've made progress in that direction. Um, we, have not, we have not achieved progress that shows up at scale uh, in terms of the, the impact. So we've, our strategic plan calls for a pretty relentless focus on improving our ability to recruit, support, retain teachers and principals. We are substantially modifying the, the uh, principal development uh, process, the principal certification exam. Um, uh, and working with educator preparation programs who develop principles to significantly raise the rigor bar um, in terms of the level of preparation for those entering that portion of the profession. The next phase of that work is the same exact work, but for teachers. Um, significantly raise the bar um, of preparation requirements. We, we you know, if you, if, if you allow the dig digression, we pay Marines, entry-level Marines, very little in this country. About $18,000 a year, I think, is what uh, Marine Corps privates make. But we don't look poorly on the caliber of their capacity. Uh, every Marine goes through boot camp, and uh, many may be called, but few are chosen. <laughs> um, that is an extraordinarily rigorous preparation um, uh, process to turn um, people into lethal killing machines. So we need a um, a similarly rigorous process for teacher preparation for a job that actually resembles brain surgery because that is in fact what our teachers do. You're not proposing paying starting teachers $18,000. No, but uh, in fact you just, need to, you sure. need to in I believe we should pay our, our teachers six figures. Um, uh, and certainly the uh, high performing teachers should be paid six figures and we should craft a, 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 an approach to the profession um, that um, that sets teachers on that path, right? But the but there's so much to to getting this right. Um, we have um, only about 23 percent of of uh, uh, folks entering the teaching profession today came from the top thirds of their graduating classes in college, um, and that speaks to how we've positioned the profession to our best and brightest young people. Well, in fact, Representative Clardy, before you arrived today, said that the statistics on the number of young people who want to go into teaching today is significantly down from what it was just a decade or more. Yeah, we're at 4.1 percent. Decade or more uh, ago. 4.1 percent of college-ready seniors in high school that express an interest in pursuing an education degree. Under the current circumstances, do you blame them? Uh, I, I, no, I don't, I don't blame them. I mean, uh, and, and it's, <laughs> you look at the sort of arc of history in, in the 1950s, we had a civilization that was set up that attracted the best and brightest women 
um, into the teaching profession because, frankly, there was no other, other option options available. Right. We didn't have to treat you all that well. We didn't have to pay you all that well. This is the only option. You can choose any Ford you want as long as it's black. All right, the, the, but our economy and our, our country is much, much in a much better place, but our approach to recruitment and retention in this profession has not, not, has not evolved to yeah. account for that. And so there's so much that we have to do in terms of compensation practices, in, ter in terms of development practices before they enter the classroom, in terms of continuous improvement practices after they enter the classroom. Well, I mean, we think about uh, 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 teaching hospitals. You have doctors making the rounds, doctors that are proposing original research, doctors that are advancing the craft of medicine. Doctors are doing the research. Are our teachers, are, are they advancing the, the teaching profession? Are they advancing, have we set up our schools to be learning hospitals where teachers are in fact driving all innovation in the teaching profession. And there are places where that has happened. There are places where the schools very thoughtfully right. created the but cultural it's, it's, conditions. It's rarer but than it is much rarer than it should be. And so that's, an, uh, again, part right. of our strategic plan is to put teachers in the driver's seat of the future of the profession. Let me go to the quickly the fourth recommendation, though very important. I don't want to give it short shrift, and that's the question of educating and employing veterans. Specifically, the recommendation was identify services for Texas veterans, advance strategies to enhance their education and employment opportunities. And then, and then the extension of that is sort of seamlessly transition them back into the workforce after serving all of us. Let me start with Commissioner Paredes and then go to Commissioner or Chairman Alcantar. What are you doing on the higher ed front to welcome veterans into higher ed beyond fending off attacks on Hazelwood? We uh, actively recruit uh, uh, either veterans or uh, soldiers that are close to separation from uh, the military. Uh, we have active programs, for example, at, uh, in Colleen at uh, Fort Hood. We have active programs in San Antonio at the various military bases, El Paso. We uh, have set up programs, for example, uh, we have online programs yeah. uh, that reach uh, soldiers, all of military personnel, all over the world, we have uh, we have uh, transition programs that uh, we have set up at uh, military bases to help uh, uh, military personnel phase into uh, civilian life. We have uh, created programs that give uh, veterans credit for experience. For example, if you were a medic in uh, the Marines, for example, you can get some credit for some of that work as you if you pursue a nursing degree. Yep. We're doing those kinds of things. And, and over the last two years, you've renewed or, or targeted your focus on those particular things. I think we've accelerated and we've intensified our focus. We've been doing things like that, one right. type or another, for a long time. Okay. Chairman, what is your version of this? Uh, we're really proud of the, the fact that we've been working together, uh, uh, not only with the cohort and TEA, but also with our, with our local partners, the uh, leaders of our installations, We've uh, continued to expand Operation well, well, um, uh, our College Credit for Heroes program. We uh, maintain our partnership with Central Texas College where our veterans are having their uh, uh, prior experience and prior learning uh, transcripted and providing evaluation. Uh, we now have uh, over 82 institutions as partners on the College Credit for Heroes initiative where uh, what we're doing there is uh, making sure that we uh, accelerate transition to work by minimizing time in the classroom. And the wonderful work that is being done here in terms of competency-based learning, prior learning assessments, and transcribing more effectively uh, credit earned uh, will pay huge dividends and it has implications in terms of more accelerated and uniform completion by our veterans and their ability to go to work and uh, really provide uh, service to the uh, companies that will be lucky to have them as a part of their teams. We've uh, uh, updated a translating tool mm -hmm. uh, so where our veterans can more effectively take those skills that have learned and, and transform and communicate those uh, in the civilian world more effectively and uniformly. We did that in partnership with our, with our military partners. We've uh, launched Operation Welcome Home where we're working in earnest uh, through a transition team to make sure that uh, we're working with these veterans 180 days before deployment. And uh, during that period, we're do, we've worked to uh, revise the uh, transition assistance program. We have made available grants for them to receive uh, certifications in high demand fields so that uh, if they're close to uh, 
having uh, that certification, they get it before they actually are released, which makes great sense. And some of those lessons are being adopted yep. by our military inst inst installations. We continue to make sure that we focus on the spouse and the families. So uh, as envisioned there, we're uh, supporting, the, uh, making sure that we have high quality care for these veterans' families as they're, uh, as they're deployed so that their children are, are in four-star and three-star NASA accredited type of facilities more uniformly. Uh, we focus on our spouses as well as our veterans through our Hiring Red, White, and You campaign. And again, I invite all of you uh, to participate in that during the week of Veterans Day where we uh, have statewide uh, hiring events. Um, these events are important. Uh, we've had, uh, last year I attended three of the 28 that we hosted and in at the ballpark, uh, we had 240 uh, employers ready to hire. So it's basically a job fair for it's, veterans. These are job yeah. fairs for veterans and their spouses. Right. But what's really encouraging is um, the, real, the, the really keen focus on, on the whole uh, family yeah. and making sure that uh, we uh, say our thank yous in the right way. These are effective ways, uh, among other things that we're testing, Good. to make sure that we put our veterans uh, back to work more efficiently. Good, uh, excellent. So those are the four recs and what the agencies have done separately and together to try to address them. We have about 10 or 15 minutes. I'm now gonna go off the board, as they say on a game show, and ask a couple of questions about the work that you all are doing on contemporary uh, matters, beginning, of course, with my friend, Commissioner Morath. <laughs> um, School Finance Commission meeting this week. Um, a, an issue that has not been uh, resolved adequately over time, not just at the moment, but we've had school finance to kick around as a subject for many, many years. The population of the state is continuing to grow, more than 80,000 kids entering the public education system every year, uh, 5.3 million in the public schools, 60% on free and reduced lunch, 60% limited English proficiency. Demographically, the school population is tracking much more ahead of the population in the main. I think it's only about 20, 25% limited English proficiency. It's not 60. It, it's it, not 60%. It, was it limiting. not 60% uh, limited English proficiency in the public education system according mm. to the TEA's own, own data? No, no? It's, it's much closer to 20. Is it much low? It's 60% free and reduced. 60% that, that, free and reduced. Yeah. I will go back and recheck that statistic on the TEA yeah. website. <laughs> um, but the demographic, the demographic uh, uh, population in the main is 43% Anglo, 37%, I think, or 39% Hispanic right now. It's above 50% Hispanic in the public schools at That's the moment. Right. That's right. It's below 30% Anglo in the public schools. The population of the public education is way ahead of where the state's population is. Um, it seems to me that the school finance thing is something that you'd want to fix, not you, but royally the you would want to fix. And that any progress that we're going to make as a state across many of these issues really begins with getting that right. Can you venture a guess, now that you've been in a job for as long as you have, why we can't fix it? No. <laughs> I mean, I'm, 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 always, I'm, I'm always left to wonder. There are very complicated problems that we solve in this country and that we solve in this state every day. More complicated, candidly, than school finance, and yet for some reason we simply cannot get this done. So uh, let, let me go ahead and take a more honest stab at answering your question. Um, the, the, at the, um, so my knowledge of the state budget um, is m mostly focused on the school finance portion, but the, the state budget as a whole um, faces tremendous pressure. Healthcare expenditures have basically been rising uh, on an unencumbered rate. And in fact, they for the first budget cycle, I think, in history, they've equaled or just passed education. Yeah, K-12 in particular. Right. As, a per uh, as a percentage that, of the overall funds That may be right. I need to budget. go back and yeah. check. Um, That's that, I think. We, is we, we, spend, we spend $58 billion a year in Texas on K-12, not a biennium, a year yeah. in, on, on K-12 education. Um, about $11,000 a kid, um, fully loaded, when you're looking at all funding sources. The, the um, uh, and then the state is growing by between 50 and 80,000 kids a year. So uh, on a, n not changing the per pupil framework at all, you got 50,000 kids times 11,000 that you get to add um, in terms of public sector expenditures annually. Um, uh, so then, um, and, and meanwhile, healthcare continues essentially eating every available resource. Right. Um, so that's sort of, 
situation A, then you have situation B, which is when any, whenever you're looking at school finance uh, proposals, there are fundamentally always two questions. Um, and they always get bundled together, but they are two separate questions. How is the money being passed out? Mm -hmm. And how much money is being passed out? Um, those are not the same question, because one is a function of, of available revenues and tax policy. The other is a function of uh, sort of distribution models to the school systems. So you can, you can address solely the how is the money question uh, passed out. And I can think of uh, incentives that could be placed in the school finance system that would be focused on outcomes. And you could, you could look at uh, and envision a school finance system that is designed to push outcomes far more aggressively than the current status quo with high levels of equity, um, et cetera. And you can do so by keeping the funding levels flat. Um, you, it, it's not to say that it will drive outcomes more, but it's a, it's a sort of a better mousetrap, but, but keeping funding flat. If you do that, then, then you make runs. Um, the runs are what legislators, legislators look at when they're faced with a proposal. And they look at how many of the districts in my area are losing money, how many of the districts in my area are gaining money, regardless of what the underlying changes and rationale are. Um, and, you know, if, if there's as many losers as there are winners, then it's going to be hard to move legislation. Well, and, and understanding that the question of school finance is not simply a matter of economics, it's almost always and maybe first and foremost a matter of politics. The reality is the current system, whatever you think of it, seems unsustainable, and especially the piece where the state gets out of the business of funding public education and all of us as property taxpayers get into the business of it increasingly. That's the inflection point right now, correct? Yeah, there's a great deal of attention given to it. I have a slightly different perspective on that. That's essentially a question of tax policy. So do you, are you funding your school districts with sales tax? Or are you funding it with property tax or some mix of the two? And, right. and the question is, is, do we have the right mix between sales tax and property tax right now? That's a, that's yeah. a question of tax policy that uh, it's, you're well, outside of my area of expertise. Let me stay slightly outside your area and ask you one more question before I go to Commissioner Perez. Great. Is it okay for the state... To, to lower the, 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 their contribution to public education, therefore forcing local entities to raise property taxes to pay for public ed and then complain that property taxes are so high? The, the, the entire system of public education is a creation of the state legislature. Um, so they, they own everything, yeah, that's, the good and the bad. So, so, so again, that fundamentally becomes a question of tax policy that the legislature's um, addressing. Right. Let me ask you a version of this question, Commissioner Paredes, um, as Commissioner Marath mops his brow and thanks me for being done with him. Um, so the state has also gotten out of the business of funding higher education and uh, Exhibit A, although it's really more like Exhibit Z2, is the University of Texas Regents approving this week unanimously an increase in tuition rates at the system campuses between something like 1% and 7%. Um, what will happen next is the predictable complaints out of this building that the universities have gone off the reservation and raised the cost to families and to students too much and made higher ed unaffordable. But of course, it is a byproduct of the legislature spending less on higher ed in the same way that property tax <coughs> payers are paying more because the state is, is spending less on, on public ed. Do you have a perspective on this? Yes, I do. I, I, I think there's there's a room for improvement uh, among all the different players involved in improving the quality and the efficiency of higher education. First of all, there was a study that was done by the uh, McKinsey Consulting Group, group uh, some years ago that I've, I found very persuasive, which uh, made the argument that uh, there's a built-in uh, cost and efficiency in higher education all over the country of somewhere between 15 and 30 percent. I I believe that to have been true when the study was done. I believe at the time that Texas was closer to the 15% then 30. rate of inefficiency than 30%. And I think we've, we've reduced that, but we can do more. Yeah. Uh, there, there is still the famous waste, fraud, and abuse that we hear about budgeting that, yes. that can be reduced to free up other resources. We have a statutory obligation to uh, make a recommendation to the legislature rega regarding levels of funding for the three sectors of higher education, two-year institutions, four-year institutions, and health-related institutions. And we've done that uh, very diligently for as long as I've been here, and obviously before then. And uh, the uh, legislature, by and large, has not come close to funding at the levels we recommended. 
It's our responsibility, as I see and I think uh, members of the coordinating board do, our responsibility is to tell the state and to tell legislatures what we think we need to fund higher education. But you can't force them to do anything. No, we can't force them to fund at any level or to fund at all for that matter. Right. I, I think uh, we, we, we should, uh, we need a, a higher level of resources, but we have a responsibility in higher education to use that money effectively and to use it to get targeted results. I think we need higher levels of accountability in higher education that approximate those that exist in, in, in K-12. K yes. So let me ask you quickly the same a version of the same question I asked Commissioner Morat. So is it okay for the legislature to, on the one hand, reduce the funding of higher education to the degree that it has, but then when university systems, as they have to do inevitably, moderately or, or in, a, in a kind of a small way as possible, raise tuition rates, then the legislature comes back and complains that they're raising tuition rates. And the fact is the same 80,000 or so kids going into the public education system are moving through the pipe, and not all of them, but many of them are showing up on the doorsteps of higher ed. So basically your population of students is growing, states cutting the share of funding for higher ed, the university systems are raising tuition rates modestly, and yet they're having to eat it from the legislature, which is complaining that they're raising the cost of tuition. Something doesn't seem right to me. I'm not gonna waste my time uh, criticizing the intrinsic nature of politics in this country. Uh, I, I <laughs> Seriously? That's my whole life. What are you talking about? Thanks a lot, Commissioner. You, you, you do it a lot better than I do. All right, fine. Um, Commissioner Alcantar, Chairman, uh, it's always nice when an email comes from the agency represented by the person on stage with me right before I'm about to get on stage with him. And indeed, I got an email from the Workforce Commission like one minute after we got up on stage. Mm -hmm. And I raced to write down what it said. Okay. Um, the, the unemployment rate in Texas is right now 4.0%, which is Sorry. below the national unemployment rate of 4.1%. It's the 20th consecutive month uh, of, uh, of job growth, I believe. And it's, we've had some unbelievable number of months, not consecutive, but almost all of the months over the last hundred and something months. Right, over the, the year growth. Yes. The, Texas, the Texas unemployment rate has been below the national unemployment rate. The private sector economy added almost 43,000 jobs in the last r reporting period. That's right. And yet you can't have workforce without work. I know that you're not the chairman of the Economic Development Corporation nor the president of the Texas Business Association's board. But I wanna ask you about the business climate in Texas coming out of the last session. We discussed this with Rob Kaplan in the last hour that there have been a lot of things that have come up in the policy arena that have run perpendicular, T-boned the business community. And the business community has gotten activated in raising the question of whether Texas is as business friendly a state today, which directly ties to your ability to manage the workforce sure. portfolio, as it has been in the past. Do you have a point of view about that? Yeah. The beauty of being an, an appointee rather than an elected uh, official is I focus on, uh, on the mission. And uh, uh, from my perspective, uh, I think it's uh, very critical that <laughs> I understand uh, where industry is going and uh, what they need to succeed. And uh, the beauty of uh, what I do is I work with the EDCs, I work with the chambers, I work with them to uh, make sure that we uh, have uh, competitive strategies that give them edge, that give them the, uh, the opportunity to build the partnerships that are critical to uh, be able to attract the, uh, the manufacturing facility uh, to uh, Sulphur Springs or, uh, or to have uh, the old uh, TI facility become the uh, new uh, place of business for the, uh, for the company that is going to be doing the work for Apple and bringing 700 jobs And in. so that's without regard to policy decisions by the legislature. You do your piece of it, they do their piece of it, and if there is an intersection, so be it. But yes, you're not really focused on the decisions that they make as they affect the decisions that you make. I focus on making sure that uh, we're building these uh, partnerships across agencies, right. that we're doing all that we can to inspire our students uh, through after school initiatives like First Robotics, like the Science Fair, which is this weekend. If any of you can go take some time to judge these projects, uh, please drive down to San Antonio. Great city, great weather, you could really help our students really understand uh, how do we make sure, uh, but, I, but, but this is a serious question. How do we make sure that our stu students in our rural areas uh, understand all that's available to them out there? How do we help uh, build the partnerships with TEA, which Mike and I, have Commissioner Morath and I have talked about, to make sure that these students and uh, have access to these 
dual credit early college opportunities and that we more uniformly and consistently excite them and ha give them some of the same capabilities to the different sectors. Yeah. But before we finish, uh, we really need to, uh, I do want to report on a couple of things that I failed to mention. We have moved forward with our work on foster kids in terms of dropout recovery and retention with, uh, with TEA. Uh, they, uh, they really supported us and uh, we came together and have some really good models to uh, demonstrate recovery and completion for our foster kids before they uh, turn 25 so that they can access post-secondary education. We uh, continue to focus on, uh, on individuals with disabilities. We not only have campaigns to hire uh, and to inspire students, but through hireability, we're focused on hiring our veterans. And all of these things are things that we've done in partnership as three agencies, but they're partnerships with our local boards, our community colleges, our universities. And, uh, and I think uh, as we bring these things together and then bring in our superintendents and uh, really focus on pushing down into the early years, uh, as Commissioner Morath has indicated, uh, there is so much work to be done, notwithstanding uh, the policy decisions that are made here and, and, and in Washington. Uh, we can't lose focus on the magnitude of all this hard work that needs to move forward. It is hard work. It's exciting work, though, when uh, you're yeah. impacting it in a positive way and leading to the uh, factors that uh, allow our companies to continue to create jobs. And it is very broad-based. It is very consistent. These occupations are transforming, and we need to make sure that the things that we do keep pace yeah. with the changes that are occurring. Let's be agile. Let's, let's be adaptable. Let's maintain our commitment to work in earnest to sustain strong partnerships. Good. So we've got a little bit of time for questions. We have a microphone somewhere in the room, again, that will reveal itself. And please put your hand up, and we're happy to have you ask questions. Andrew White again. I'm really enjoying asking questions for a change. I'm usually answering them these, these days. But thank you for coming. I appreciate y'all. It's, it's a wonderful panel. Uh, as it relates to the 60 by 30 plan, Mike, do private school vouchers help you in that plan, or do they hurt you in that plan? Um, I, you know, I think the, the key challenge for us is to make sure that we have great schools uh, for all of our kids um, uh, and, and ensuring that we have a, a great school in every town, in every village, in every hamlet, uh, in every city um, uh, for every kid regardless of zip code. That is, um, uh, that is our mission. Um, uh, who is actually in charge of those schools and how they come into existence, I'm um, a lot more ambivalent about. Ma'am. Thank you. Susan Dawson again. Uh, Commissioners Morath and Paredes, um, I'm, my question is about measuring college readiness. If you look at our own local measures, if you look at Mike Martyr's state measures, college readiness has dropped like a rock. But it has also dropped like a rock on an entirely different measure to an entirely different group of students than we used to measure college readiness for. And our schools would say that it is not well aligned to the curriculum they're teaching and confusing to both uh, families and to schools. How do we get to a single college readiness measure? Maybe it's the ACT, maybe it's something that we create that's actually well aligned to what we're saying schools need to teach and that is provided to every single student in the state so that we know how many of our students are actually college ready. We, we actually do have an assessment instrument that's aligned with the State College of Career Readiness. It's called the Texas Success Initiative Assessment, and uh, the numbers there are not, are, are not encouraging. I think about a third of uh, Texas high school students score well on that, uh, on that measure. Of those who take it. Of those who take it, yes. Yeah, and, and, uh, and actually the, the percentages on ACT and SAT are within three or four percentage points of what we get on the TSIA. Uh, one encouraging thing that's happening now is, is uh, Mike and I have talked about, uh, he's, he's told me that uh, uh, he's aligning uh, expectations in K-12 with 60 by 30 Texas. Uh, for the first time since I've been here, the uh, chair of uh, the State Board of Education, Donna Bohorich, uh, called me some months ago and said, we want some representatives from the coordinating board to be involved in the work of developing the new TEKS or the new the new uh, curriculum and assessments. Uh, that's, a, that's a very positive step. I think we're moving in the direction of, of having a, a more coherent partnership between higher education and public education. I don't know if, it, I don't know if, if, if uh, 
using one, one assessment is better than using three and knowing what, what, uh, what the meaning of the results are or is. I, I, but I, th I think we're, we're getting, a, getting closer to a coherent system of education K through 16 and beyond into the workforce. I, I would echo that. I, the, the, um, the need for a singular um, assessment, I, I think, is, is uh, for all the reasons that he said, um, somewhat less compelling than the need for 100% coverage of students, which is not currently um, a, a function of, of um, the, our policy framework. And so um, that, would, that would likely lead to uh, significant improvements in uh, alignment within the system. Susan, you look like you ate a lemon. Did you, are you unhappy with the answer? Yeah. No, that, that's certainly yeah, true. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Let's take another before we wrap at uh, 12, uh, 15. Any more for the commissioners? You got to whack at them for the first time here, or maybe the, <laughs> in some cases. In the front, ma'am. My name is Yvonne Batts, and uh, I am a small business owner, mm -hmm. which is predominantly what America is made up of, um, from a very small town, Abilene in West Texas. And I feel like that we're representative of Texas because we have very, very strong K-12, three school districts out there. We have several four-year colleges, two-year colleges, trade schools, and our workforce development uh, with Mary Ross mm -hmm. out there is outstanding and very strong. As a result, also, um, we as business owners have a responsibility to work with all of you. And I think that's what we're going to have to turn to, are the companies, is the private sectors in helping uh, create jobs and help opportunity for these young people. We work very closely together. We just came back from a week last night in Medellin, Colombia. We're visiting Grupo Natresa, which is a, a global coffee company, and they happen to have a small subsidiary in Abilene, uh, Abimore, which is for distribution all over. And so we have worked very close with them. They've brought in, in a short period of time, 650 jobs, and now they're going to bring over their coffee and their chocolate in addition to the others, and they're looking at us for that distribution. I'm getting a little hungry. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess my point is, that I th our delegation there included the superintendent of the school district, yep. uh, the city manager, uh, president of the chamber of commerce, business owners, and uh, and all together is how we're going to be able to do it. We can't right. just depend on depend on taxes and the government. Right. So please let the businesses help you. And and that's obviously a good place to end this conversation because the point of this tri agency effort is that to the questioner's point, it's not one entity solving the problem, it's every entity solving the problem. No, I agree. I, I want to thank you first for doing business in Texas. A uh, small business owner in Texas is the backbone of our economy. We work in partnership uh, uh, with the governor's office and others to sponsor these small business forums uh, for, for our small business employers because they uh, do lead the way. They're a part of the supply chain. When you're talking about the big companies like Toyota, there are so many suppliers that have evolved uh, out of that and created so many jobs. And when you're in West Texas, when you're in Abilene, uh, the uh, unique uh, circumstances there uh, are really, uh, uh, it's really great to see the uh, partnerships that have evolved around the different sectors of the economy there and the way that you are working together. We partner up with the EDC there uh, on, on matching grants and a number of other things. But the, uh, the point that you make is that we do need industry to inform our curriculum. Uh, so it's one thing to create uh, yep. an endorsement, but if the curriculum doesn't reflect that, right. uh, what it's, it's important that we embed in that curriculum the uh, certifications and skills uh, as, uh, to reflect the changes that are occurring. And so uh, for me, I can see to say, uh, I, I differ a little bit from, uh, from some of the comment, from one of the comments earlier, and that is that we do need more people going to college. Uh, we didn't, uh, that's the whole point of 60 by 30 Texas. Uh, not everybody needs to go to college, but more 
I guess people say that. My point has always been we need more people going to college and getting certifications and credentials that right. allow them to be welders, that allow them to be right. technicians. The point is it's not, it's not a cookie cutter answer. There's well, not one answer for everybody. Well, my, my point is that uh, there's so much work underway that right. we need to be careful uh, to uh, really inspire and not yeah. confuse. Because a student uh, that may want to be a welder working in the, Petro uh, in the Gulf Coast yeah. does need to go to San Jacinto or Lone Star. And a technician going to work for Samsung does need to go to HCC yeah. in order to obtain some uh, uh, absent and early college model that equips them with that. But in right. that scenario, they're still getting college. Yeah, they're already in college. Yeah, it's yes. a fair point. We are at the, the closing hour of our uh, conversation. Please thank the commissioners, Morath, Paredes, and Alcantara. Thank you very much.